Welcome to On Record PR, where we go on record with industry leaders to discuss best practices for public relations strategies that drive business success. Let's get started with the show. Welcome to On Record PR. I'm your host, Gina Rubel, and the founder and CEO of Peoria Rubel Communications. Today, I welcome Deborah Ferrone, founder of Ferrone Advisors, LLC, to discuss best practices for personal business development. Deborah is the author of Best Practices, Marketing and Business Development for Law Firms, which is a book published by PLI and based on more than 60 interviews with successful law firm leaders and marketers, general counsel, and innovators in the profession. Earlier this year, Deborah was inducted into the Legal Marketing Association Hall of Fame, and she is a fellow of the College of Law Practice Management. Just some background on Deborah. During the past two decades, she carved out a niche by distinguishing herself as the chief marketing officer of two of the world's most prestigious law firms. Prior to diving into legal marketing, however, she worked at a global management consulting firm's Towers Perrin, which some of you now know as Willis Towers Watson. She's also well-versed in the work of public relations agencies, like the work that I do here at Fury Rubel, having worked at Ketchum Communications. So as you might imagine, we have a lot of things to talk about. So please, please welcome Deborah Farron. Deborah, I'm so happy to be with you today. I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> you know, we get to see each other a lot of the same conferences. We live about two hours, if you have to go through the Lincoln Tunnel, of course, away from each other. <laughs> and yeah. here we are virtually on our podcast. So I'm excited to see you. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. My pleasure. I know we have so much in common between social media, women's issues, marketing, strategy. So this is a real treat for me to get the chance to speak with you. And we both love all sorts of ethnic foods. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's why I married an Italian. There you go. <laughs> One of the reasons. There you go. One of many, I'm sure. So tell our listeners about how you went from in-house at a law firm to founding for own advisors. Well, I was fortunate. I, I think I had a long shelf life. I was at Deba Voice as their CMO for 14 years and then Cravath for 14 years. And I, I knew I had been at an agency. I had been at a consulting firm and I thought the one thing I hadn't done was consulted individually on my own. And although, you know, when you're in-house, you're constantly consulting the people that you work with, I thought this would be something that I'd want to do as my next step. And at the same time, I was thinking about it. PLI asked if I would write a book and I thought, that's great. You know, I'm going to consider the book my first client. But as it happened, when I launched, I ended up getting some law firms calling me and developed clients at the same time. So it just worked out. Well, it's interesting. It, it seems both, you know, for some of us, I would think it was so intentional. And yet it was so, it could have been very unintentional. You're writing the book, you're interviewing these leaders in law, and you're developing relationships. It's very true. I think, you know, you try to set yourself up for success in, in marketing. You know, you make sure that you are always developing contacts. And I, I tell the lawyers that I work with the same thing and the consultants that I work with the same thing. You never know where that next opportunity is going to come. So you want to make sure that you're doing everything that you do with your whole heart and with full intent of making sure that you're doing it professionally. And so I was very fortunate in that I ended up getting these initial clients and I did work for some great firms, including Gunderson, Detmer and Deckard and a few others that were kind of right off the bat. And so I was very fortunate. But if that hadn't happened, I would have happily spent my first year writing a book. It's nice to be able to write a book and to have that opportunity. And, and this is what I like to tell clients all the time, you know, whether you're writing a book, writing an article, when you talk to others, when you quote others, there's not only more validity, but you're you're building a better relationship with them. And obviously knowing you, everyone, and I've read your book, everyone in the book has so much to add. So I, I really do recommend to our listeners that if you're in legal or even professional marketing, 
in this space, it's it's so worth reading and really understanding how other people think. That's so kind. And I feel the same way about your book too. It really is a, a must read. And you're right. I often will tell the people that I work with, if you're going to write an article, think about who you can quote. Who is it that you want to get to know? Who is it that is influential within your sphere in which you're working? And so you're absolutely right. That can help build terrific relationships. So Deborah, what are some of the lessons you learned from your book interviews? It was great to see things that we've always been taught really being applied. And one of the perfect examples was Barry Wolf at Wild Gotcha. Barry believes that you need to wow your clients. And obviously that's something they do at Wild Gotcha because they do phenomenally well. But he would talk about wowing clients, whether it was to a group of partners, whether it was to a group of associates, whether it was to staff, at every juncture he had the opportunity to. And so this idea of communicating, 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 and having an idea of where you want to go is so vital. But I really saw Barry put it into action, which was great to see. Another great lesson, I think Bob Gunderson at Gunderson Detmer really taught me and spent a lot of time with him in the process of writing the book. They focus just on startup companies and they do it phenomenally well. They don't do other kinds of work that are not startup related. So they'll represent startups, but they'll represent venture capital and they'll represent the venture capitalists and the various funds, but they stick with that world. And I think there's something to be said about sticking with your knitting and doing what you do really well. And there are other firms like Oric, where if you talk to them, they will also say, you know, this is something that we do. Mitch Zukli says we have two or three areas that we are really focused on, and that's where we're going to focus. And I think there is a certain magic with knowing those areas that your firm is going to focus on and doing that very, very well. So there were lots of lessons that I learned both about marketing and about business and seeing those theories that really we've been told that work really put into action. I love that. And I encourage all of our listeners to get a copy of your book, read it, and read not only your wisdom, but all the lessons you learned from the many, many people that you had the opportunity and I'm sure pleasure to interview. You and I spoke earlier this year at the Association for Legal Administrators Annual Conference, and we had a great conversation about your focus and where Throne Advisors is going and why. And so I want to ask you a little bit about um, your focus on women and where that's going and, and why you think it's so important. Well, I've always been interested in helping individuals market. And as I've been doing this, I've noticed that women very often, whether it's intentional or not intentional, I don't think it has been intentional, but have not been invited into the important pitches as often as their male counterparts. And by doing that and by kind of excluding women in that way, women haven't had the same exposure to role models that I think men have had. Not only the role models that they meet on a pitch, but the actual partners who are rainmakers in their firm. And so I love the idea of helping women by giving them the tools to understand how to market and how to do those things that they would have learned from mentors or they would have learned from role models had they been included. And I think the same thing is true for really all minorities. I was at a New York City Bar Association program a little over two years ago, and we were talking about how a number of the people in the audience who were minorities felt they were invited into a pitch, but after the pitch happened and the business was won, they never saw the client again. And what could they do? And I had been someone who had handled new business pitches, you know, at two large firms. I had never even heard of that happening. I thought, you know, these people are invited in on a pitch, whether they're women or minorities, of course, they're going to work on the matter. And I hope that at the firms that I worked at, they were, but I think there are many places where they're not. And my question is, well, how can we give those folks the keys to be able to develop their own business in the meantime and gain their own confidence. So I've loved working, especially with women and minorities. I think it's 
it's something that we all can do. And I feel that we all need to give back whatever tools we've gained. So it's a good opportunity to do that. And it's so important today with 50% of people in the workplace being women and a very large percentage, you know, it's changed. So when I went to law school, it was 50% men and women. When my dad went to law school and graduated in 1971, he had two women in his, his class and very, very few people of color. So it's just from the perspective of history, it's time to give everyone the tools. Uh, my husband has a saying, give people the rules and tools they need to succeed. And I love that because and when I say rules, it's it could be things like, you know, how to manage your your personal brand, which I know is something you do and the tools to do that. So speaking of which, why is there an interest in personal branding? Oh, I think it's such an offshoot of what we've been doing with branding. You know, my my firm has done strategic plans for law firms, and we've also done practice plans for law firms. For one particular client, I help them with PR, but just one. So everyone else I keep on sending to you because I think you're wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but I think personal brand really looks at the smallest subset of branding, the individual. And it's important today more than ever because with more people making lateral moves from one firm to another and with firms becoming, you know, these incredible places that are an amalgam of various lawyers, I think lawyers owe it to themselves to establish a personal brand So what are some tips for people to things that they can do for personal branding? What are some ideas that you have for them? Well, I always believe that strategy needs to come before tactics. So in order to develop a strategy, I think you need to look at your personal brand as it is today and then figure out where it is that you want to go. So take a look at your LinkedIn profile and by all means, improve that. Spend a little time each week looking at LinkedIn at a minimum, make sure that your profile is not only concise, but really reflects who you are as an individual, what makes you different, what makes you unusual, why someone who you are communicating to would hire you. And I would look at your profile across all social media and your bios and really be able to figure out just initially how it is that you're being perceived. That's just a first step. But I do suggest that when people are really looking at personal brand, that they work with an outside consultant because I think they need an outside perspective. I think that's very valuable with this. I don't think the days exist anymore where you can rest on the laurels of being at a great firm. I mean, being at a great firm is wonderful. It removes some of the questions that you might get from a GC or from a board of directors that knows of your firm and knows of their brand. But I think personal brand is just so vital. And it's also how you reach out to people, how you have relationships with people. So there are lots of different things that you can do. But I think it starts with looking at your own strategy and developing some tactics. And I'm going going to agree with you wholeheartedly on having someone else outside of your family, even outside of your your normal professional sphere, look at your bio. And the reason, and and your your profile for that matter, because the one thing we miss is that we don't know how everyone else thinks and what everyone else perceives. And what one of us might perceive as completely professional, or we might use language that we think is inclusive. There could be words that are triggers. There could be words that identify implicit bias. So there's so much that it's not just... And I think this is really important for the listeners to hear. It's not just hire someone. It's there's a reason. The reasons go deep. And we don't know how we come across. And the hardest thing we do, even in communications, the hardest thing for you and I to do is write our own bios. Yeah, we could do it for everyone else, right? Because we're, we, you're stuck in your own space. So I say that because it's there's so many reasons. There's so much I've learned by even consultants and other team members who have reviewed my materials. Absolutely. I think we all need an outside perspective. And even if you can't you know, afford an outside coach or consultant, I think it's important to think about your bio and all of your materials from the view of your client, 
So think about your typical client over the last five years, maybe come up with a persona, figure out who those people basically are and what their needs are and read your bio and all of your material from the perspective of them, not from the perspective of what you have to sell, but of the perspective of what they are going to need to buy in a sense. So flip the way that you've been looking at it. (laughs) Then think about what your objectives are and some tactics to be able to achieve that. So you had mentioned that you write strategic plans. Should people and or law firms write their own strategic plans? No. (laughs) Why? (laughs) No, it's political enough when you have an outsider helping you, but you know, some of the decisions that need to come up in a good strategic plan are things that are going to be slightly controversial. So maybe you decide that you are going to focus in on three practice areas and the fourth practice area is wondering, well, why aren't I getting the bigger piece of the pie for marketing dollars this year? And some of those discussions are just better had with an outsider. I work with a terrific guy who does the finance side when we're doing a strategic plan. And some of these decisions not only are controversial, but they involve deep dives into not only profitability of practice areas and industry groups, but also profitability per partner and really looking at what the partner is bringing into the firm and trying to make those hard decisions about where potential profitability is. And they're just hard conversations to have. You know, it's interesting. I equate corporate strategic planning, which is different than writing strategic communications plans, but corporate strategic planning to seeing a doctor and having the doctor look at all of the different aspects of one's health. You know, so think about a company as having health whether it's your your financial health, your emotional health, in other words, the, the health of the people, and you know all of those things. And it's not just the financial health of the, the health of the firm, it's the practice groups or the industry groups, it's the individuals. And oftentimes too, and listeners, no matter where you are, where you're coming from, it's really important to get that outside perspective because sometimes it's the leaders who are creating an unhealthy culture and they can't see it. Right, right. So it's, you know, you look at all these different variables, but someone who has had the experience of doing this for other firms is going to know that variable variable C is very important, more important than variable A, because they've seen what it can do in the past. And so using someone who has had experience with other firms does help. And The other thing that I think firms can kind of do themselves, which is really important, is practice planning. And that's something, you know, that, yes, it helps to have someone from the outside do, but to put together an annual plan to be able to tell your practice where they're going and get everyone to agree on it at the beginning of the year is so helpful. The one complaint that I get from partners at law firms is they're not quite sure about what's expected from them and where their practice is going. And so I think there's some very easy steps that law firms can take that will make a big difference in doing that. I agree. And we all get stuck in the rut of doing the work that we do. But if we don't step back and evaluate, it's hard for lawyers and any professionals to do that themselves because they're busy doing their work. Absolutely. Absolutely. It makes the most sense. So what holds some people back from rainmaking? We we were talking a lot about women and minorities or, or protected people in protected classes. I want to ask you about women. What holds women back from rainmaking? I think there are two main reasons that I've seen. I think the first is is not knowing how to do it, whatever the it is. You know, they haven't seen the role models time and time again do the asking. And they don't feel comfortable and it feels like putting yourself out there and you may be rejected and they're not quite sure how to ask for the business, which is one of the reasons I role play with a lot of my clients. And it sounds silly, but we really take real world situations and do that role playing. But I think without mentors and without seeing precedent, which I think lawyers are so interested in seeing, it's very hard. So there's this big not knowing. And then again, it's the fear of rejection. We've all read the Larry Richards material about resilience and people are concerned about being rejected. But if 
If you find a partner, this is interesting, or a lawyer at a firm who has sales in their background, they're much more likely to be resistant to that. They are more apt to be out there and realize that, yeah, you don't win everything. And you know what? If you don't win something, it's not the end of the world, or it's not necessarily a binary decision whether someone's going to hire you or not hire you. Even if someone doesn't hire you, doesn't mean that they're not going to five years from now or that someone who sat in on that business call might become GC someplace else. So these are long tail decisions. And I think when lawyers realize that and they realize that the fear of rejection really shouldn't even exist because there is no such thing as rejection in a world where people are constantly networking and constantly moving, that dissipates. And so sometimes it's just getting people past that fear and giving them, as your husband would say, right? The right tools. People need the right tools to be able to do these things. I love that. And, you know, I, when I finally found that nothing in business is personal and really accepted that. So, you know, I own that. Like you said, there's really no such thing as rejection. It's just not the right fit at the moment. Something will shift and change. And if it ever is the right fit, it'll, it will come back. And that's really one of the things I've learned as a business owner. And I'm sure you feel it as a consultant as well. We also don't take all the business that comes our way. Right. Not always the right fit. And it might be because we just don't have the bandwidth or it's not a cultural fit or there's somebody else that we think can do it more strategically or better at the moment. And so it's just fascinating if you take all that emotion out of it, how much more we enjoy our work. Absolutely. It's true. Some of it is a numbers game, you know, and I think especially when you're starting out as a a partner at a firm or with your own business, you are going to have a number of rejections. You know, you are, I remember the first new business pitch I was asked for where someone wanted a, a document and I was pitching against a number of firms, which I now no longer do. I've learned that, you know, that that isn't a game that I necessarily want to play in, but you would write these very long pitches and you may get it or you might not get it. It's a little bit of a question of, do you want to participate or not? That's the first important question. And I face this in-house as a CMO. You know, you don't necessarily want to pitch for things that the firm is not capable of doing or that are not going to be advantageous to the potential client, might not be the right fit. And you have to get very good at saying yes, no, when you're given those opportunities. So you want to find the right work for you that's going to be really enjoyable, where you really can make a difference, where you love your clients. You know, you have to look for those opportunities. And those are the ones that you'll do really well. And with that, we're going to pause for a message from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Furia Rubel Communications. Recognized as the number one agency by the National Law Journal, Furia Rubel helps top businesses and law firms with high-stakes public relations and marketing, reputation management, crisis planning, and incident response, including high-profile litigation media relations. To learn more, go to furiarubel.com or email podcast at furiarubel.com. Welcome back, everyone. And Deborah Ferrone, thank you for being here with us today. So we're talking a lot about professional development, personal development in the legal industry in particular. What are some of the trends you're seeing in the legal industry? Well, I do think people are focusing now more than ever on keeping their associates happy and their partners happy at their firms. And they're struggling with the whole work work from home environment. I do see them doing more training as you probably do. You know, I I think that they have to be very intentional about training because people are not in the office five days a week. So I've seen video training on business development. I've seen video training on presentation skills on Zoom and how you adapt for that. So I think training overall I think anyone who is involved in it has had to make it a lot more interesting and compelling and realize that adults don't think on one wavelength for more than 12 minutes. And so you need to break it up and make it, you know, a kind of a fun presentation, even if it's the driest of subjects. So I think training has been just 
changing dramatically. I also see the rise of personal branding that is something here to stay. And I think lastly, I've seen a huge uptick in the use of social media and LinkedIn, which I think is a real positive. You know, we all talk about poo-pooing technology and that maybe it's the end of the world that kids are on their phones all the time. But I do think it can be used to the advantage, especially for the legal community to get out there and to get their opinions known and also to be able to network in a time where we're not necessarily still seeing people as much face to face. Do you see an uptick in the trend in developing and implementing marketing strategy across law firms? Absolutely. I think they're taking it much more seriously. You know, they realize that this is an expense, but it's an expense that you have to have in any kind of a business. You know, you can't just say, oh, we're going to, you know, have a marketing department because that's what our lawyers want and they'll help them market when the lawyers need it. You really need to have a marketing department that is proactive, that works directly with the partnership, that is strategic, that identifies trends, identifies opportunities, focuses on business development strategy, all those things. And I think firms are taking it a lot more seriously. I think they're really developing strategic plans for the firm, but also working in conjunction with the marketing department to make sure that those things really get done. So I heard you say expense. And one of the things that as a former practicing lawyer and as a communicator now, how do we shift the mindset from expense to investment? It's revenue generation. You know, I just spoke with a a firm about a CRM system. This is a London-based firm and why they needed a CRM. And we talked about it and I said, these are business questions. These are not marketing questions, you know, in the classic sense. You know, all of these things are part of helping the business grow. And I think, you know, we were also excited a few years ago about big data and big data is great, but it's what you do with it. So I think it's very important for marketers to really sell back to the firm and use those you know, quantifiable results to say, this is how many people we reached. And this is where these clients are coming from. And this is why it makes an impact. And although it is hard to show ROI in professional services, and it's something I've seen people struggle with for the last 20 years, I think it's important to at least have those metrics to be able to sell a story as a marketer. I agree a gazillion percent. (laughs) There's a gazillion out there. I agree. I find it If you're having a conversation about why you should have a CRM and somewhere else in the firm, somebody's saying marketing doesn't work. Right. This is what happens. So for for those who are lawyers listening, if you think marketing doesn't work and you're not measuring it, then stop saying it doesn't work because it's like saying I have high blood pressure, but you've never taken your blood pressure. Exactly. It, It just makes absolutely no sense. It is... There's no evidence that it doesn't work. And that CRM is just a foundational tool. Going back to that example of tools and rules or rules and tools, it's a tool that allows you to not only measure, but to do it better every time. Right, right. And I think it's interesting if you look at the question of what's the biggest problem with law firm marketing departments, I think it's twofold. I think it's resources and I think it's also respect. And I think those two things are really tied into one another because you can't get someone to do something without the proper tools and without leadership really behind it. And so when you have a leader of a firm who is not a champion of getting out there and developing business or a champion of marketing or a champion of communications, It almost doesn't matter how hard you try as a marketer or as an outside PR firm if they're not believing it and they're reticent because as marketers, we're advocates, but we need the tools, we need the resources, we need the technology, especially to be able to get these things done. And so a lot of marketers end up trying to market with their hands behind their back and just can't be done. And And if I might add, mm -hmm. they need the information which means having a seat at the table. They need to be given trust. Right. We've seen a huge difference between the firms 
where the CMO has a seat at the table and the firms where the CMO is really relegated to back office work. And it it makes a tremendous difference. You know, also the chairman needs to be a role model. The chairman needs to be out there networking and knowing people's names on the administrative staff and walking office to office. I've seen chairmen who are like that. I've also seen chairmen who stay in their office all day and just wait for the appointments to happen. And we know which is is more effective and more useful. So it's very, it, it becomes very clear, you know, where the problems stem from when you look at a law firm. You can, maybe it's just from doing this for a long time, but asking the right questions, you can pretty clearly see where the the blind spots are. If you had to give our listeners a few tips on here's some things you can do today to get out there and network yourself either virtually or in person, what are some of the things that you would tell them that they should be doing? What a great question. Well, I think the first thing, and I tell, I, I only coach about, I don't know how many I can handle, but six individual lawyers, you know, I just don't have half the bandwidth to handle more than that a year. So, but what I usually start by telling them is look at who you've made new business presentations to over the last few years. Have you stayed in touch with those people? Have you linked in with those people? Have you had a conversation with them? You know, look back and see your past history of of pitching. Also look at who you've won. You know, are you staying in touch with those people? Do you have a regular system to be in touch with them, whether it's calendaring it, whether it's a tickler file, whatever works for you and different things will work for different people. But I think that's an easy kind of takeaway. And the other thing I would do is make sure, you know, with LinkedIn, it's a funny situation. I was at a PLI presentation right before the pandemic, and I asked the audience members, mainly lawyers at at law firms, how many of you have been on LinkedIn this week? And very few raised their hand. And then I turned to the general counsel who I was next to on the panel and asked him, you know, when was the last time you were on LinkedIn? And he said, five minutes ago, he said, I'm on every day. I need, I meet someone. I want to check them out. So I think the tip is be on LinkedIn. More GCs are on than ever before. And even if you're not going to write original content, comment on what people have written and add your contacts in and use the little bell on top to make sure that you're tracking the companies that you're interested in. So there's a lot that can be done, but I think those are two easy to implement steps. That's fantastic. And, you know, I can't tell you how many lawyers, I can tell you because you know it already, how many lawyers say, oh, I don't need to be on LinkedIn. And it's, you know, especially in corporate. And yet the GCs are looking to validate them to see who they're connected to, to see what kind of content they share. And, you know, if I might add, make sure you're sharing things that are of value to others, not just yourself. For me, I went to law school and I remember the typical bio started with the word I so many times. And from the perspective of how to share the value that you bring to others, how can lawyers read their bios differently so, or write their bios differently so that they're demonstrating that? I would consider why clients or potential clients hire you. Is it because they're in trouble? Is it because they want to create a company? Is it because they want to protect IP? And I would, would write it with that in mind and lead with that. Why do companies want to hire you? And maybe that means starting with a quote. Maybe that means, you know, focusing on those clients and really articulating why it is that they hire you. I love that. Well, with that, Deborah, do you have any questions for me? I would love to ask you what trends you've been seeing because you were really on the ground with your clients, seeing what they're doing as far as PR. What have you been seeing? So from the industry perspective, the biggest thing is associate and talent retention and acquisition, whether you want to call it the great resignation or there's a shift, there's a big sea change as a result of the pandemic. Mid-sized firms are having a very hard time keeping talent that's being recruited out by big firms. Big firms and mid-sized firms are having a hard time retaining diverse talent who are getting recruited out by their clients. It's really fascinating. There's an important shift in 
personal and professional development for the associates, for the partners, for the diverse members of your firms, and also creating cohorts where people within diverse community can have dialogue and feel safe. So creating those safe environments. And another big trend we're seeing is a focus on behavioral health and providing the resources that people need coming out of. I say coming out of with a caveat. I don't know that we're actually out of a pandemic. We're at a different phase of managing life with a new virus out there. But Everything has changed. So even, and one of the biggest trends we're seeing is flexible work environments and how to have that and yet still be the kind of managing partner who goes, quote, unquote, office to office. How do you do that? And and what are the tools and ways to do that differently? So those are some of the things we're seeing in trends, which from a PR perspective means a greater reliance on digital media a greater reliance on things like getting engaged on LinkedIn, not just having a profile. So I agree with everything you've had to say. So Deborah, I want to thank you again for joining me today. Where can our listeners get more information about you? Probably the best places are LinkedIn. And I also um, have a website, which is deborahferone.com. And so both of those things are quite easy, but I am on Twitter and I'm on Instagram. So all of that you can get to from my website. That is fantastic. So with that, I'm going to thank our listeners for tuning in today. If you'd like to read more about Deborah, we'll have her full bio in our show notes. And I encourage you to send in questions or other ideas for guests. Have a great day, Deborah. Thank you, Gina. Thank you for listening to On Record PR. Visit our website, onrecordpr.com, to subscribe to the show, share it with your friends on social media, find show notes, additional episodes, and more information. We'll see you next time. In the meantime, feel free to send us questions or show ideas at podcast at onrecordpr.com.